Okay, let me um, please introduce the first contributor, the first speaker, Adrienne Laroche. Adrienne Laroche was born in uh, Paris and is a former student of the Ecole Normale Supérieure. He completed his doctorate in philosophy under Jacques Derrida in 1960, oh, sorry, 1996. <laughs> and the Ecole des Autitudes en Sciences Sociales, and he is author of essays and fictions, as, uh, for example, Les Orphelins, uh, which has been translated uh, uh, under the title Orphans in 2014, Les Hérétiques in 2006, and La Restitution. And for the sanitary of Jean Genet's birth, um, the Arsenal Pulp Press has published a translation of his essay and the book The, Lost, uh, the Last Genet, a writer and revolt, which was translated also to English, and it's a very important book reflecting on the years between 1968 and 86 by Jean Genet, the writer, the French writer Jean Genet, and his commitment to the revolutionary movements of the Palestinians and the Black Panther movement. And he wrote a very important essay called Violence and Brutality, reflecting also on the kind of movements within Europe as for the example Red Army Fraction. And Adrienne is going to refer to this one. So, uh, furthermore, uh, Adrienne is also working at the moment on Dujon Déchet, Les Hommes, Les Objets, La Catastrophe, on the occasion of Marcel Dujon's retrospective at the Centre Pompidou in Paris, and also Derrida, Traumas for the 10th anniversary of Derrida's death. And I'm very honored and very grateful that Adrienne agreed to present today um, paper on uh, Jean Genet, and Denise Ferreira da Silva agreed to read a short uh, excerpt, uh, an entrance towards Adrienne's lecture. And I would like to ask both of you to come to stage, and Denise is going to read one page, and Adrienne is going to follow uh, his paper from there. Thank you. I like to to say hello to everybody, and I like to to thank uh, Doreen Mende to for our, for a very generous invitation. We we never met before. I know I know she she read me, and then we were in conversation. We were supposed to meet in Nottingham Contemporary two years ago, and finally we are here. And uh, I am here thanks to her, and I really like to to say thank you, and also to Denise uh, Ferrada da Silva, whom I asked to to read a very brief. Uh, very brief uh, Jean Genet's uh, extract, uh, extract of um, Thief Journal. So thank you very much, uh, Denise, and now you can read it if you like. Um, okay, this is my first, so let's see how it goes. <laughs> um, Beneath a lamppost in a street of the city where I'm writing, the pallid face of an old woman, a round, flat, little face, like the moon, very pale. I cannot tell whether it was sad or hypocritical. She approached me, told me she was very poor, and asked for a little money. The gentleness of this moon-fished face revealed to me at once. The old woman had just come out of prison. She's a thief, I said to myself, as I walked from her, a kind of intense reverie, living deep within me and not at the edge of my mind, led me to think that it was perhaps my mother whom I just met. I know nothing of her who abandoned me in the cradle, but I hoped it was that old thief who begged at night. What if what if it were she? I thought as I walked away from the old woman. Ah, uh, if it were, if it were, if it were, I would 
cover her with flowers, with gladulus and roses, with kisses. I'll weep with tenderness over those moonfish eyes, over that round, foolish face. And why, I went on, why weep over it? I did not take my mind, it did not take my mind long to replace these cautionary marks of tenderness by some other gestures. Even the vilest and the most contemptible, which I empowered to mean as much as the kisses or the tears or the flowers. I'd be glad to slobber all over her, I thought, overflowing with love. Does the word glau, glau, mentioned above bring into play the word glavio, gobs of spirit, to slobber of her hair or vomit into her hands? But I would, but I would adore that thief who is my mother. Merci beaucoup. This passage comes early on in the Thief Journal, published in 1946. The narrator describes a tube of Vaseline, and that description conjures up an image of this mother. The man who is considering spitting or slobbing on his mother, is he not orphaned of his humanity? Politics, according to Erasmus, for example, is it not this movement that pro propels us towards other men? moves outward to greet them. Politics means mutual recognition, respect, equality. It is meant to ensure happiness. The man who dreams of spitting on his mother crosses the border between person and non-person. Is that not true? Let's try and be a little clearer. The man who is writing is not spitting in his mother's face. He's dreaming of it. Then. This old woman maybe is not even the mother of the man who is writing. Even, in the act, even if the act of spitting on another person, on a woman, mother or not, belongs to the category of odious deeds indeed. If the act of drooling on her hair or vomiting on her hands is specifically named, the act of spitting on the woman who conceived you is brought up only obliquely, sideways, diagonally, like a gob of spit itself. I all but invented that act. It is mentioned between parentheses and as a metonymy or understatement. Either that or by association with the word glaiole, it's a French flower, and the word glavio, which means gobs of spit, viscous substance, mucus, phlegm, or spit. As if for Jeunet himself, dreaming of spitting on his mother was something impossible. To sum it up quickly, the man who would dare consider spitting on his mother, the mother who represents institution, tradition, and even religion, such a man could not help but get involved in a kind of poetics, a dangerous and worrisome kind of politics, anarchy, negative, violent. The man who dreams of spitting on his mother, an old woman, cannot help but engage in politics disastrous for everything human. But I repeat, he did not spit. He did not use that word, but only in passing and in parenthesis, the word slobber. He, dream, he dreamed of doing it. But the spirit of Genet, that he himself sets in opposition to what he calls the interior of the self, does undertake to spit, vomit, and drool on the mother figure on humanity. Perhaps I'm going too quickly. The act I am describing here is more eloquent than long speeches. If you understand is fundamental ambivalence, the burden of distress he presupposes, the violence he summons up towards the self as well the irresistible movement that makes him go towards the worst when instead he wishes to love, that singular bond with humanity he assumes, the humor aimed first at himself and the love for any number of beings that underpins it, the challenge offered to all who hear him, the unhappiness, the talent, writing, then 
you will have understood a lot about the man I'm talking about. This guy. So after this brief introduction, I will name three moments of the last Genèse experience and insight regarding violence <coughs> and its relation to language. As you know, as Doreen just mentioned, between 1968 and 1986, Genet hoped everywhere things were hoping in the world. In, this is to quote Derrida's Gla en français. It's uh, Genet saute partout où ça saute dans le monde. So the writer was seen in Chicago and Jordan. He traveled to Strasbourg and Chartres in France. He met parties and movements and the men who made them, the Black Panthers in the United States, the Red Army Fraction in Germany, the Palestinians in the Middle East. Everywhere he went, he saw the degenerated. He spent 15 years on the side of men from everywhere and began writing his last book, Posthumous Prisoner of Love. He says, and I quote, when I finished with writing, I was 34, 35. But that was a dream. It was in any case a daydream, a rêverie. I wrote in prison. Once I became free, I was lost. And I didn't find myself again in reality, in the real world, until I was with two revolutionary movements, the Black Panthers and the Palestinians. So then I submitted myself to the real world. I was acting in relation to the real world and no longer to the grammatical world. First moment, the George Jackson story. It is political. Working toward his liberation, Genet continued to seek ties linking the poetic and the real world. This trial, George Jackson trial, is really the beginning of a long investigation into the relationship between violence and writing, a concern for the writer. George Jackson, whose name would long echo in Genet's consciousness, had been in prison since 1960 for robbing a gas station. He was under the fine and the light prison sentence, but parole hearing after parole hearing, he was denied. He would never walk free. He was still incarcerated when, at the Soledad prison on January 30, 1970, a guard named Miller killed three blacks in the yard and injured one white. Miller was acquitted. Shortly after, a gun named Mills was shot. Three blacks stood accused. George Jackson, John Clutchett, and Fletra Drumgo, who became known as the Soledad Brothers. All were ultimately found innocent of murdering Mills, but on August 21, 1971, Jackson was assassinated by a prison guard at the prison of Saint-Quentin. So Genet reads George Jackson's letters. The Red and the Black, an article he wrote at the time, was the second installment of his book, previously began in the introduction to Soledad Brother, the book of collected letters of George Jackson. Here, by way of vocabulary, Genet would attempt to exonerate the prisoner at the risk of death. As he once pointed out in transcribing the brochure of the Soledad Defense Committee, the equation is simple, I quote Genet. A white man kills three black men. He remains innocent. A white man falls from a wall. Three black men will be sentenced. Jackson was one of them. Without preamble, I end the quote. Without preamble, Genet launched his attack. I quote again. George Jackson's book is a murderous act. Beyond all measure, but never, never demented, even if Jackson's sufferings and fevers drove him to the door of madness, a door he never entered, it is a radical murder undertaken in the solitude of a cell and the certainty of belonging to a people still living under slavery. And this murder, which is ongoing, is perpetrated not only against white America, against the American will to power, against what is called the entre entrepreneurial spirit. 
It is a systematic and concerted murder of the whole white world, greedy to drape itself in the hides of non-white people. It is the hopefully definitive murder of stupidity in action. End of quote. Genet insisted on murder to make a clear distinction from another act, the assassination of Mills de Garde. Murder and assassination are therefore opposed, as I quote, this sort of degradation, the assassination, to Jackson's long undertaking, murder by means of the book. The task at hand was to save a man from a possible death sentence. Faced with the impending threat, threat Genet first isolated himself and then delivered this judgment. And I quote again, it is obvious that if Jackson wrote his book, and he did write it, he was incapable of carrying out the assassination. End of quote. Assist evident. As the men of Germany's Red Army faction were sometimes known to write, thought, reflection, and analysis have departed, doubt without a doubt, has been given leave of absence. Is this the expression of despair, of a desolate attempt or ongoing misfortune? I don't know. Genet went further. In the same breath, he tried to acquit, to acquit, acquit Angela Davis. She is there, but you don't see her very well. Uh, she was also in prison at the time and accused of having sold weapons. I quote Genet, we can see Angela Davis' work and her alleged gun purchase in the same light. Angela's goals, the liberation of the black ghettos, would be annihilated by the purchase of weapons for individuals cap cap capable of inspiring a fleeting terror that would contradict the full scope of the project. So Genet concluded with an unequivocal statement, Angela did not buy any guns. The actions of Genet and Jackson seen together go like this. First, the writer came to the defense of the Panthers party, an armed group. Then he defended the prisoners who were disarmed by launching a manifesto calling for murder. And finally, he defended the man confronted with death in the name of writing. Genet made the book the proof of his innocence. Facing the death penalty, Jackson wrote a book. Once assassinated, he would be found innocent of the crime he didn't commit. But would he be innocent because he wrote a book and then assassinated for having written it? That's not the issue. As Jackson saw it, Genet was trying to go from petty crime to major, even political, offense. In a way, he was now motivated by truth, the point of transmutation. Jackson was the one who was still in prison and no doubt working to better himself, transform the thief's aims into political projects. By rejecting society as it was and needing to make the government capitulate, Jackson wanted to change the government as well as the power structure itself. It was all about liberation from the ghetto. Liberation meant an escape from captivity and surveillance, a move beyond racism and skin, an exit from identity, nation, and state. So, Genet coming to Jackson's defense may have appeared as the smallest of gestures. It should be seen as a monumental undertaking that of freeing himself from the whole, from prison, from the circle of fecal matter, eschewing the myth, the myth of being born in prison to look elsewhere. Jackson wrote his book to show the scale of his political project. Genet came to his defense to free him from prison so he could achieve his own political goals. The result of their actions, they were no longer bound by prison's shit and crusted chain, by the relation between judge and hoodlums, nor by the chain of command. By making the distinction between murder and assassination, 
Genet wanted to clear Jackson. It seems that by differentiating murder from assassination, Genet was, by the same token, separating language and death, the trial forcing him into that separation. But in order to save Jackson, he argued that since Jackson had written a book, he couldn't be guilty of murder. Genet presented the book as murder, refusing to leave the topic of violence altogether and maintaining the possibility of violence in language. That is, by insisting on the necessity to check for poetry in the world, he refused the separation. He was only willing to deal with the problem of proving Jackson's innocence by insisting on murder and by doing so, risking the creation of many more problems. We could even consider whether Genet's words were not providing enough rope to hang Jackson. Using murder by book as a defense for a man facing death sentence meant, meant both resisting the temptation of a verbose defense, which would probably have been more humanist, and asserting the possibility of death. The practical effect of the political and poetic act was nothing less than the destruction of a certain notion of the man. Making any positive assertion regarding Genet's politics is a very delicate matter due to his approach. I try to describe the scope of his political project, abandon the prison system and transform society. The difficult matter of exploding out of jail, away from racism and from fascism, and therefore from shame, was never radical, continuous, or final. Therefore, Genet's political action were absolutely opposed to murder. After Jackson's death on August 21, 1971, Genet reflected, I quote, Recently, I, meant, I mean, when it still seemed possible that Jackson would leave, I spoke of his book as murder, and I did not suspect that the murderer would be killed by the police. Genet never saw George Jackson's body. I move to the second uh, scene. This is 1977. Genet grew interested in the Rote Armee Fraktion. The Red Army Fraktion seems to be the opposite of May 68, he says, but also its continuation, especially its continuation. On September the 2nd, 1977, Genet published in Le Monde an article called Violence and Brutality, where he saw the Red Army Fraction as, I quote, one of the islands of this archipelago of the Western Gulag and being inside a giant ear, which is the prison. So from October 1971 to June 19, uh, 1972, Horst Mahler, Margret Schiller, Andreas Bader, Holger Mainz, Gudrun Enslin, and Ulrike Meinhof, the RAF, the Rote Armee Fraction, were arrested. And on June 6, the courts ordered the, the Red Army Fraction group to be kept in isolation in the Steinheim prison. On September the 5th, 1977, three days after Genet intervention in Le Monde, violence and brutality, the second generation of the Rote Armee Fraction abducted Hans Martin Schleyer. Genet wrote the same day, and I quote, what we owe to the Rote Armee Fraction in general is that they have made us understand not only by words, but by action, that violence alone can bring an end to the brutality of men. On October 18, 1977, um, Ulrike Meinhof was found hanged in her cell. Olga Mainz died of hunger strike, 
and by October 18, the, the, the whole uh, group were, was found dead in their cells, maybe, maybe, suicided by society. So the archaeology of the concept of violence was at the forefront of Genet's vocabulary. He was interested in the difference between violence and brutality with an eye on their effects in the vast and terrible world. Political action, when possible, can only be accomplished if a connection is made between the outcrops of language, humanity, and world. The best, the, this basic definition, violence and brutality, came to Genève from observing the black printers lives in America. But this was not the last word. The opposition reappeared in 1973, this time in defense of the Palestinians, and I quote, by violence, I mean breaking free of the process of closing in on the self which keeps us from truly living. Buds breaking open, that's violence. When grains of wheat grow, bursting through the surface of the earth, that's violence too. Already, this, was, this, this one was set against its own shadow. And I quote again, in fact, brutality is incompatible with violence. This new definition was framed by a couple of statesmen that supported it, prolonged it, as well as limited it. Genet began by writing, and I quote, bearing arms is not everything in life. And he concluded with a call to discard a, falsi a falsified story that in the end, violence and brutality were the real translations. So, then, during a 1983 interview in Vienna, to which I will come back soon to end my intervention, Genet remembered, I'm afraid you are, I quote, I'm afraid you are confusing the two words. A confusion I pointed out in, in an article I published six years ago in Le Monde on violence and brutality. Having just said that, he joined action and words, and he says, I'm going to push you. Don't be offended, I'm being brutal. If I am brutal just like that, on a whim or for fun, I can be brutal, but then it leads to nothing. But if I am violent, for example, when a man or a woman is raising a child, when they teach him A, B, C, D, the child whines, the child gets bored, and the mother insists, A, B, here's the mother coming back, the mother from the beginning. She's inflicting violence. She's teaching him something when he had rather be playing, but it's good violence. Here is the last example and the first experience, the ABCs of the writer's violence. An, an unexpected short secret bridged the gap between violence and the learning of language. A child binds humans and the world with violence permanently. In the end, here, speech reveals itself to be good violence. It is violence, and it can be seen in the relationship between those who speak, those who stop talking, those who are denied the right to express themselves, those who speak poorly, those who are mute, those who are locked up. Violence in language binds the wretchedness of the infamous to the power structure. Genet draws our, at, draws our attention to a precise point in a relationship between those in power and those incarcerated language. This point is political. I have killed and I have inherited. The cellmate of the Italian philosopher Antonio Gramsci, also a political prisoner, repeated those words over and over. But language contains legacy, which is violence. Poverty and wealth are henceforth bound together as is the possibility of a new relationship between the self and the world. This was Genet's experience the experience of a man who physically felt the violence of the relation between the world, language, and the self. He felt that violence, he remembered it, and it flowed with his words. Last scene. 
during an interview in uh, December 1975, Genet, now 65, recalls the occupation in France, his old age, his sickness, and his stories. He recalls Nazism and death. His interlocutor is German. His name is Uber Ficht. And the man declares that he is taken aback by Genet's admiration of Hitler. And Genet says, yes, but I was 30 years old when I wrote my books. And he's referring to the Thief Journal, which was written in 1946 when Genet was 35. And now I am 65. So after that joke, he clarifies, and I, I have a, a semi-long quote of, of Genet answering the question of Hubert Ficht about the admiration for Hitler. Yes and no. It has drained away, but the space has not been occupied by anything else. It's a void. It's quite strange for someone who leaves this void. What did it mean, this fascination for brutes, for assassins, or for Hitler? In more direct and perhaps also simple terms, I remind you that I was an orphan. I was raised by public welfare. I found out very early on that I wasn't French, as that I didn't belong to the village. I was raised in the Massif Central. I found this out in a very stupid, silly way. The teacher asked us to write a little essay in which each student would describe his house. I described mine. It happened that the teacher thought my description was the prettiest. He read it out, and everyone made fun of me, saying, that's not his house, he's a foundling. And then there was such an emptiness, such a degradation. I immediately became such a stranger. Oh, the word is not too strong. To hate France is nothing. You have to do more than hate, more than loathe France. Finally, I... Finally, I and the fact that the French army, the most prestigious thing in the world 30 years ago, that they surrendered to the troops of an, Austri of an Austrian corporal, well, to me, that was absolutely thrilling. I was avenged. But I'm well aware that it was not me who wrote, who wrote this vengeance. I am not the maker of my vengeance, end of quote. Genet then concludes with his famous comment, I quote, perhaps I am a black whose color is white or pink, but black. I don't know my family. And then he goes on to speak about the Black Panthers and, and George Jackson. Emptiness, then joy, joy, then emptiness. A moment of this story has passed. All of Genet's spectacular political claims refer back to the origins of the writer. The anacoluton, so the violent syntactic rupture that juxtapose Hitler's name and a classroom in Morvan, the claim to being black and the orphan status. The violence to which he testifies may be small in grammar, yet it's huge in the vast and terrible world. The founding child status is simultaneously subjective, neither father nor mother, political, non-citizenship, and historical, Hitler. As a ward of the states and a one-time thief, the writer is deprived of his civil rights. He is thus not entirely French. He is foreign, and to say it as he does is not an empty act, but a way of insisting on a political reality. In the French school system, the children laughed at the spindly poet. Without a home, without rights, he is stateless, an outsider. Hitler avenges the political affront Genet suffered from the children's teasing. This is not this house. Here we find a turning point. Genet mentioned that he's not responsible. Hitler has taken his place. He knows as much. He says, I am not the architect of my own revenge. At the time of George Jackson's trial, Genet will move away from the logic of the avenged. Here, rather than testify in his own name, he prefers to fill the void with someone else's. Hence, he is no responsible longer. 
rather than accepting vengeance and the act of vengeance committed by another, he could stand up and say, all I ask is to be able to answer. I must be offered what should have been mine by obligation. His last book's tonality, The Captive Lover, is, a, is the will to, to a trial, to absolutely refuse Hitler's name, which is reactive politics, reparation, racism, antisemitism, but to recover speech again. Not to wreak vengeance, but to speak his truth. This is the hope of coming out, coming out of shame. Submission to reality, whether it is successful or not, is the writer's act of resistance. The hatred for France and provisional admiration for Hitler are intertwined in the same way as the love for the Palestinians and the circumstantial hate for Israel. Yet, the defeat of France was also the massacre of Jews, if the Palestinian victory is won politically over the Israelis. This is an astounding collusion on Jeunet's part. The writer's life and work are found fully formed in this concurrence between a childhood with political consequences and a political view that fills childhood's vacuum. And to end, I will quote Malcolm X, who said once, and I quote Malcolm X, I've never seen a black man move any limit. A black man is not allowed to come near the limit. The white man takes care of that. <laughs> End of quote. Let's take the color for what it is. Let's not draw any new borders now, which are traps, Jeannette tells us. But we must ask ourselves instead, who are the one who see to limits? What does seeing a limit signify? What of the uncauterized limit between two eras, between violence and brutality, murder and assassination, the real world and the grammatical world? Jeunet stands at the breaking point, at the unhealed limit between two eras, when everything is still possible and when there is no further reason to hope. Thank you.